<laughs> Welcome to Psychology Cast. I'm joined by yours truly, Hashu, who is Smash Bengali, and he's going to join his journey on why he does what he does, what he do, what he does in the media world, and educate us around the Bengali concepts around our language and identity. Welcome, Hashu, to the show. Thank you so much for having me, bro, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Sao and Chibai Buchoni, you know what I'm saying? Man had to roll through with a cup of tea, bro. It's going to be an interesting conversation. I got mine as well. Podcast oh. on my therapy. Oh, sick. That's a, that's a, uh, I don't have any cool message on mine, man. But you know what? Maybe I'll write a uh, Kihobor on there. Yes. Uh, reference to the t shirt and that. Yeah. Um, what's the word? Yeah. So you can see it, right? So obviously, for what people might be watching and not listening, but um, I've got Kihobor t shirt, which means. What's up? And it's 50 years um, an anniversary, I suppose, of independence of Bangladesh. And I think it's very poignant that we are doing this podcast with yourself, who actually is educating people like us and those who are non from our you know, Bangladeshi background to let us know what our etiquettes are like and our mannerisms and our behaviorisms. Yeah, for sure, man. And you know what? Uh, like uh, the whole phrase, Kihobol. Uh, like it's just, uh, you know, uh, one of those phrases that just really sticks out from the Bengali language. Because obviously, like in Shuddha Basha, like in Dhaka, you hear it a lot. But, you know, you do hear those silly uncles just be like, Ki do you know what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, man, I love the reference. Yeah, I'd, what's the word? doesn't say like, um, we're going to come into that podcast about that, like, you know, um, how you use um, these types of like concept, uh, concepts and scenarios to and put it into different formats so that we become much more familiar with them and relatable. But tell us about yourself. What are you doing at the moment? Are you, I believe that you're a radio presenter, but I think um, give us a, a, a sneak insight into what you're up to, to audience. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, I, it's so difficult to just be like, oh, who, like, what do you do in it? Because I feel like over the past two years, um, like my uh, kind of, a role in society, my role to my family, like just as a whole has evolved so much. But to try and put it in some kind of nutshell, yeah, um, I, I do week a weekend breakfast for Asian Network. So I'm waking the nation up on a Saturday and a Sunday. Uh, and I also do Fridays uh, as a co-host with uh, the weekday uh, breakfast host, Nikita Kando. Uh, and then other than that, I also run a community page called the Gushti, uh, which is uh, like literally just like my heart, man. I, like I love the community on there. It used to originally be my own personal Instagram page and I converted it into a community page because I always wanted to have a, a community page. And I saw other ones that were about on Instagram. And, you know, sometimes there's like, people that have had content po posted up there and they they wanted it uh, taken down like I'm talking about these other pages and they haven't been respectful to other content creators or they haven't like pushed like um Bengali artists and stuff like that so I was like hold on a minute like I want to I want to have my own page so that whenever someone does DM me like for a shout out I have a page that I can you know support them with um so that's uh, something that I run with my wife and other than that, uh, every Wednesday in the evenings, I help out at my dad's restaurant, uh, front of house, uh, you know, like literally ser uh, serving customers, washing up, hearing my dad shout at me like, <laughs> like, check it again fam, you haven't packed it right. Uh, I, that's what I do on a Wednesday and that's my life at the moment, man. Weeks go back by, by very fast. Wow, you saw you're still you're working in your front of house on the uh, seven customers, and why do you do that for? Like, is is it because you just feel that's something that you should owe to your dad or your family, or is it actually just quite fun to do? It was a uh, it was a couple things to be honest. It's like uh, I grew up with um, just my dad not being around much, uh, just because he was grinding, bro, and uh, obviously like the markup in the restaurant industry is something that I don't think gets talked about enough because for example like the amount of time and effort and ingredients required to make a curry is so much more expensive than like a 12 inch pizza but they'll probably sell for about the same price uh but the pizza will probably sell for more even though the pizza probably costs like like two pound to make but the curry you're looking at at least like 
five pound or even more like do you know what i'm saying in terms of effort and labor when you include that but um because my dad was always working so hard to like provide uh for me and the whole family like we're four kids uh and like i'm the youngest uh alhamdulillah like we're all self-sufficient and older now but growing up like he wasn't around much and even though we're at a point now where like we can kind of work and pay the bills like it's the only thing he knows so he still like works in the restaurant and i think a lot of bengalis can probably relate to this because we are the backbone of the like british curry industry like let's be real um we're the ones that are upholding it at the moment um like uh, if you want to spend time with your dad sometimes you've got to go to where he is and for me it's that like it's the one time of the week where i get to spend some time with my dad and uh i enjoy it as well like genuinely we've got the regulars um sometimes you get drunk people <laughs> like i literally posted a video on tiktok the other day of this drunk guy that came and he was just asleep <laughs> like in the restaurant uh and i was like what do i do um so it's it's uh it's it's a really interesting experience and um i feel like it's where my roots are as a british bangladeshi in a sense because a lot of british bangladeshis made their mark through the curry industry well, I think that's that's one of the, one of the interesting things of um, that has been crossed my mind about food is like a currency for us. Like we, you can find Bengalis anywhere in the world because of our food, and mm. because of that uniqueness to combine those ingredients to produce like such a you know a tasteful dish, a dishes creativity. Um, I wonder what other Bengalis around the world would be thinking about how 50 years and where we've come and where we've traveled into parts of the world what do you think about that yeah for sure i think like the crazy thing about bengali cuisine in particular is just how diverse it is because you know you go to like chittagong you see like the use of like different types of rice flour to make so many different types of like uh well dumplings like fitas and um you also see the use of uh, a lot more like coconut milk and coconut and stuff like that and then you you go up to dakha like puran uh, puran dakha and it's all about kachi biryani and like you know it, it's all about you know um that quick workers food like having like you know that kind of food and street food and stuff like that and um it's amazing to see like how bengali food has traveled across the world uh, one really interesting story actually yeah that i want to share with you bro is um so i used to work uh at jaguar land rover it's where i did my grad scheme and as part of a work trip one time i got sent out to germany right and i got lost bro like i got lost like in germany and i didn't know how to get uh, back to the train station and it was getting really late and then suddenly i found a bengali restaurant and then I, I was like, oh, wait, I can't speak German to no one, but I can speak Bengali, though. And then it was just like, whoa, like it was and it was in um, this area called Leipzig. And if you Google it, it is literally like a ghost town, bro. But I was like, how have like my people ended up here? And Alhamdulillah, like they're here because they can help me like uh, find my way back. And man, I ate there. They show me so much love. But uh, it's beautiful, man, to see like the fact that one thing we can also draw from our cuisine uh, and the point I drew earlier about the labor and ingredients and um, everything being so much more in Bengali uh, cuisines and food and curry is that we genuinely like love to work hard and we love to put love and effort into what we do. And you can see that with the amount of entrepreneurship. I'm talking like small businesses that pop up on Instagram uh, that become huge successes over time. Um, but first and foremost every uh, type of effort and like work starts at home like how you treat uh, the people around you and it, because it starts at home like it starts with the food and if we put that much effort like it's a lot of effort to make curry bro like it actually is and we put that much effort into feed ourselves so yeah man it just shows how hard working we are kind of like in, in our heritage or anything like you know when you think about the trade of the trade of like Bengal back in the day like before mm. um you know we were Bangladesh but just that region we were always forward thinking thinking about how to be economical and be adventurous and ambitious and adventurous like I think it's it's part of our heritage part of our history 
hundred percent. Like even um, like when I was a young kid and I went to Bangladesh for the first time, um, going to the Bari, like my mom's village, uh, and seeing like my uncles how they do the harvest for uh, the dan, like the wheat and the rice, uh, mm-hmm. and how they go about like because li- I was there for a, a whole year. So I saw like all the seasons and stuff. So it was amazing because I was like, wow, like this is how they actually make rice. And um, yeah, it's just like, it goes so deep, bro, into our ancestry, just like going back years and years and years and years to the beginning of civilization. Like, you know, it's crazy to think like where we've come and how far our people have come as well. Yeah, the question for me is like that's why it interested in became it became interested in you what you were doing around um, doing something different, but also still related to our heritage. Um, talking about your community page, uh, Smash Bengali, um, there's a lot of comedy on there, and through the comedy's educational purposes. My first question to you on that then is, when was the first time you made someone laugh? Do you think like? When you when you not on the page, but perhaps when you were younger, when you were small. Oh, that's a really good question. You know, um, I'm actually trying to remember. I feel like you know when I was a kid, like I was just one of those kids that I had really goofy teeth, right? And I used to be really chubby, so I didn't necessarily like actually do something. People would genuine like kids in my class would literally look at me and just laugh. <laughs> and I was like, why are they laughing? Like, but it was just like almost the the um just natural reaction. And I used to like it. I was I used to be like, you know what? I like making people laugh. Um, so that definitely um I had one of my friends uh, uh like in uh, primary school called George, uh, who's like basically just this typical white kid, yeah, like he you cannot get more of a bloke, you know, like when you see a like and that that's a bloke like he grew up to be a bloke and um one of the first times that I made him laugh was I was telling him about uh when I was a kid yeah like basically there was a, a jar in it of uh, biscuits like in my house uh what I'd done yeah is I felt like I was gonna do a really smelly fad in it so I didn't want to like stink out the whole house so what I did was I opened this uh, jar of biscuits and then I done it in there and then I closed it back up <laughs> and, then, and then my sister went to go eat oh, one what? of the biscuits right yeah, yeah. And, then, and then she was she tasted one of them and she was like oh this tastes like mold <laughs> and then I told him that story and then he was like dying so um but also just like Man, now that I think back to my childhood, just even saying like stuff in school, like because I was still like figuring out the fact that I speak Bengali at home, I speak English at school, like there would be sometimes really like easy misconceptions that would happen. For example, they would be going around the class saying like, oh, like what does everyone's uh, daddy do for a living? And for me in Bengali, daddy means like grandma, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. it came to me and I was like, oh, my daddy's dead. Do you know what I'm saying? So everyone was like, oh, like, do you know what I'm saying? And then I'm like, why? Why is everyone doing this? And then I'd go back home and then I'd tell my uh, uh, siblings and then they would like, like be crying of laughter because they'll be like, oh, my God, like, you don't understand. And they don't explain to me. So just stuff like that, man. But um, I think one of the beauties of life, uh, one of the biggest blessings that we have as like just humans, as Muslims, is the fact that we have scenarios that can invoke this. Like laughter is such an interesting thing. Like when you think about it, it's like uh, uh, an uncontrollable like reaction from your body, like sneezing and it's instinct. So it's beautiful to be able to share that and bring that out of people. It can also act towards like, a, you know, um, reacting towards stress, isn't it? Like. Mm. When there's a stressful situation, when something happens, we tend to uh, re- um, react through different ways. And one of them is, you know, using humour, mm. um, a peaceful um, and probably much more um, healthier way rather than violence, for example. Uh, and I think humour is a very good way we de-stress. Um, you, lo- you use a lot of humour. Have you realised that when people laugh, they might be laughing because they're having a stressful day? Uh, a stressful moment in their life and then this pops up and it just basically hits home and it makes you feel good makes you feel uh, like a sense of belonging if you like 
Oh yeah, for sure. Like I've experienced it in corporate situations. There was this one time I was actually I fully, I, I don't know if they had the intention to mug me or not, but there was these two uh, boys, they didn't look like, like Manusha, Manusha they look like Guru's fam. They look like, yeah. they look like they were, you know, on something and they were coming up to me and then they were just asking me like, oh, where are you going and this, that. And then I just went up to them and I was like, oh, you know, uh, I'm just going home to see my niece. She's three months, you know, she's got born recently. And I was just telling them like something with a really open uh, intention, like with love in it. And it wasn't necessarily to make them laugh, but then they just had a laugh and then they were like, all right, man, like uh, you, you, on your way and go, go to wherever you need to. And it's just like, I love like being able to um, uh, use it uh, in a way to uplift people, but also as just like, it's my, uh, it's really interesting because you're touching on something that I don't actually open up to a lot of people about, but sometimes I use my ability to make people laugh to, uh, put someone at an arm's length and be like, you stayed there. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I'm five foot seven and I can't fight you, but you stayed there. And <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> because um, everyone has like their strengths and my strength is that. So I own it to the fullest um, in whatever way I can. And uh, I think it's a, a beautiful, beautiful thing because, you know, you're not using violence. It's a healthy way. You're uplifting people. You're de-stressing people. And I think everyone needs to make more effort to make sure that they're you know doing things to make themselves laugh enjoy themselves and also make others uh, around them that they care about laugh and even if you don't care about them still make them laugh because you'll earn heaven points yeah i, I must already i mean i got I, I, there's, there's so much stuff he said there and there was something that stuck out which is uh, a phrase that he was ringing in my ear um something my mom would say like when i was growing up as a kid um you know that term um, you know, and it's mm. that, that way to say that, you know, like uh, it's kind of like I don't know, it's like I remember like um, thinking, is mom talking about me or is she talking about other people? Like, <laughs> saying like, you know, like this kind of thing, right? Yeah, like, it's like the, the classic line is, Tui na guru, guru, yeah, you know yeah, yeah. or like, oh, manushir lakhan oite kundin. It's like, when are you gonna become? like other human beings you know what i'm saying like that's literally the uh, stress because i feel like you know um there is always uh something within our uh, parents generation of like being able to live up to the standards of society um and you know i think that the, where they kind of slip up a little bit is they don't understand society is forever changing so the society that they sometimes try to uphold us to doesn't exist anymore real talk so it's changed into something completely different so it's also trying to be like trying to open their minds in a respectful way but um yeah man it, it's definitely uh one of those phrases that are just iconic i think i think i was reflecting i was thinking like i know we chatted some time ago but uh, i was reflecting that I think that's one of the reasons why I came into psychology because my mom embedded it into me about manush, right? people, behavior. I think myself, these are those early influences because my mom suffers with a you know, uh, mental illness mm. and it's something that's not obviously talked about in our wider community. That's why I do what I do with the others about talking openly about mental health and how we should conduct ourselves and how we progress and reach out for potential. Um, Wanted to get your thoughts on that about mental health in the Bangladeshi sort of like you know conversation. Is it because we don't have the dialogue? Like you know our language is we don't it's not a written language. Uh, I know there's like there's Bangla, but in terms of our facility sort of way we approach, um, and it, you know when we talk about mental health, we might not have the same vocabulary as we do in the you know what we do in the Western world. We just access in a different way um, because we talk about our world being in a different way. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. A hundred percent. I feel like um, the mental health framework of like Bengalis, uh, let's put British Bangladeshis to one side for a second and just focus on our parents' generation of like their mental health framework is so interesting because like it comes down to a few different bubbles that overlap with each other and become a Venn diagram. And I feel like one of them is like the Islamic framework, which they rely heavily on uh, for their mental health. Uh, another one, I definitely do feel like vocabulary is one of those things that uh, work uh, for and against you because the, Bung uh, like the Bengali language, like in terms of 
um, you know, speaking in Shuddo, uh, Basha, like, it's very articulate. But with Sileti, I feel like there are certain um, emotions that are mm. dampened within the Sileti dialect. Uh, some examples include romance, for example. Like, if you're trying to be romantic in <laughs> Sileti, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's like uh it's techie, bro, because you can literally say to her, "You're a piece of my liver," and it's meant to be romantic. But it's like, wait, you translate it to English, and it's like, what what's he trying to say here? But um, it's really interesting because it's like it, even to say like uh love, like in Shuddo you got balobasha, but in Sileti it's like oh like I'm to to or uh, uh, like I uh, like. Um, <laughs> That's like, I fancy you, or like, yeah, I'm yeah. fond of you, yeah. or like, I mean, tomorrow, balafai. But it's not like, there's a, a balo basha is actually like, should not used in uh, Sileti. So it's really interesting. And then also, like, um, uh, like saying sorry, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, which is a fundamental part of, yes. you know, mental health, like being able to overcome disagreements by apologizing and owning up to your uh, like issues, like whatever uh, wrongs you did and acknowledging them and healing from them. Because uh, at the end of the day, if you don't acknowledge a wrong, then you can't repair the root from uh, that it destroyed. So it's like, uh, you know, in Shuddo, you would say, oh, like, I'm a koma koredo. Like, you know, but it's like in Sileti, can you think of a term that is specifically sorry besides the English word sorry? I think apart from, yeah, apart from, it's more of an expression like forgive me or forgiveness, isn't it? Forgive yeah, me, Mahfuria, though, like forgive yeah. me. Yeah. But, but it's like it. there's no word for sorry. like I'm sorry, isn't it? You know what I'm saying? It's like you forgive me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so I'm like, it's such an interesting, uh, like a vocabulary dilemma almost but i was trying to see things in a positive light so i'm like but the Sileti language is so beautiful because as you can see from some of the videos that i make everything's funnier when you say it in Sileti, even if you just translate like uh, like a cartoon into Sileti, it's 10 times funnier um so it's crazy man like uh, but you raise a really interesting point bro I, th I think there's um, there's this video that captured my mind, which um, I came across yours, um, and it was something to do with like there was a family scenario. So I think it was a there was a husband and a wife, and and they were talking about kids, and the, the you know you burst into the room as the wife, and saying something about right you know about benefits and you know like what are you gonna do you know what are you doing and you know and just like the the reaction and I, I can hear those sort of sounds and you know, those exp uh, phrases being done in other households. And for me, I was just like, you really captured it, those, like, in the high stress the mm -hmm. lady was like, experiencing. Did that situation or that moment come from, like, a certain scenario that you are exposed to? How did you come across your sketches, basically? Um, how did you put yeah. that together? Uh, so, because my dad owns a family restaurant, um, we've had, like, so many different types of workers, like, come in and out. Um, so, it's always... Like my sketches are always a mishmash of my personal like bit of creativity and being like, oh, this will make it interesting, and also like different scenarios that I've grown up seeing. So, for example, in that one, it's like, uh, the woman saying like, oh, you've gambled all my benefit money away, and there literally used to be a guy at our family restaurant that used to take his wages, and he had a gambling addiction, so he would not only like get rid of uh gamble away the uh, his wife's um uh, like uh benefits but also mm -hmm. like his wages and stuff and I remember like it, it w got to a point where um he like actually borrowed some money off like my dad and then he would come round to like get more and then we would have to like st like not like open the door because he would just be standing there um so it was pro it's proper madman so uh that's like so but I never it's only I'm only linking it to that because you've asked me. But when I actually wrote the sketch, it was just those are the lines that I thought of. So it's really interesting because a lot of the time, like when I write stuff, it's just I want to write something. L let me make it as funny as possible. What things can I touch on? And then uh, it just try and let it flow. Yeah, because I think that there was such a you know, powerful way because it's kind of like tapped into so many different things about social relationships 
you tackle more addiction, and you talked about obviously socioeconomics, about benefits and gambling and reacting to a certain moment. Um, do you think those kind of like sketches um, that you're doing um, would go like mainstream into the UK, for example? Because when I think about comedy in general, because I watch a lot of comedy, um, I used to watch like, you know, One of the Horses, One from the Grave, uh, Clipping Appearances, those kind of like British classical sitcom right, series. Mm. But I just, and they capture like moments of British life, if you like, and it happens and it's quite funny. But do you think like with your content, like your sketches will it will go into the mainstream? Perhaps it might be yourself, it might be other people, but is that something you see that happening or is that some, and is that something you'd like to see happen? Oh, I would love to see it happen. And also, can I just say, yeah, One Foot in the Grave was so funny. Like, even just the uh, intro with the tur- uh, the tortoise used to make me laugh, bro. And the song, like, I just used to find that so funny. That unlocked a different childhood memory. But, uh, yeah, um, with, like, my uh, content that I've put out there, I never expected it to uh, have the kind of outreach that it has done and I feel like it's been a bit of a soft burner because it's like when I first re- released content like uh, maybe it got like I don't know um like a couple thousand views like uh real talk like over the course of a couple months but like because it's been out there in the world for like mm, five six years now it's just been like loads of people have just seen it over time um so i feel like the concepts and things that i've touched on i would love to see it in the uh, mainstream because we did have goodness gracious me um but tv has changed a lot over time i feel like the removal of canned laughter for example uh as a, a type of um uh, art form within comedy uh, shows has definitely made a a, a different uh, format for comedy and the way it's uh, done now on screen so sometimes the uh, content that would have been on tv with canned laughter works better on social platforms like youtube and tiktok as short comedy where and the laugh that would have come on tv at at the end is just the the end of uh, the uh, the video on tiktok so you're the one that's laughing at the end of it so everything's been shortened down um, so if you did have a show like, for example, Harry Enfield, and then you've got all those pauses mm-hmm. where you would have had canned laughter or, fr- or you're watching Friends, all those little gags, like they've just turned into like 15 second TikToks now. And you're basically just doing the canned laughter in your brain as a dopamine hit. So it's really interesting how media has changed. And I feel like for me, um, although like as uh, a 90s kid, like my dream would be to have my own sketch show and playing loads of different characters and showing all these scenarios on the big screen to a wide public where it's presented in a, a really respectful, available way that's inclusive to all, all cultures uh, and just caters for like a mainstream audience. Um, I don't know whether it will actually happen, sadly, because so like even TV is changing so much now. Like, when was the last time you watched TV besides the World Cup? <laughs> um, I suppose um, I, I rarely watch it. I watch it on, you know, I play and stuff like that, catch up. Um, but I only watch certain programmes. So if there's a good set, like a series, or there's a comedy that's come out on like three or four episodes, I'll watch it. Mm. Um, but in terms of actual live TV, no, I don't think I've ever watched TV apart from obviously, um, you know, Asian football that I watch. Um, mm. But no, no live TV. Yeah, it's changed so much. So, like yeah man it's like a dream i'll put it out there i'm open to it i hope it happens <laughs> but you never know bro i gotta keep just doing what i'm doing yeah so if anyone's listening um you know what's the word please um contact uh, Hashu and discuss the opportunity because it'd be great to have like a you know say bbc three sort of like a you know a series even or bbc two you have a set you just do six episodes mm-hmm. as a start and as a season and just see how it goes i mean I think like it's important for because we're we're British, mm. um, it's we we need to um, kind of like share what our what our lives are like because it creates dialogue and then people don't get scared of us and you know actually we're the same as you we like to go shopping we like to eat we like our football um, we're like any other person really but mm. I think there's so much stuff that for example reference we talk about earlier about food we've already given value I think. We can give value in different forms and it's just like it, it needs to be much more a representative space so that's why i feel anyway because 
you, you know, when I tell and encourage others, I'm like, hey, watch this program, you get information this way, um, see if they communicate in another way through comedy, through, you know, um, meaning, then it's really good for not just for people like us, but also people who might not be Bengali to find out that what we've got, what we like. 100% like, and you know, I find other cultures super interesting. Uh, so I think, you know, being able to provide that opportunity and they are doing it in different ways. Like there's an organization called Diamond now, which is like uh, an impartiality, like online survey. So if you ever do TV, like you have to fill it out uh, as an optional thing. And then they're always monitoring, like based on whoever's doing TV, like whether um, there has been like a certain quota hit on like particular ethnic backgrounds within the UK and stuff like that. So hopefully, man, fingers crossed. But if it ever does happen, obviously there needs to be a psychological uh, aftercare in it. So also, <laughs> if you if you take me, you have to take Dr. Jalel because he's my brother. Yes, I suppose. Have you seen? No, thank you. I was say, Have you seen then people who do nothing? Uh, no, but okay. I, I've been told about it. Yeah, it's it's a very um because they started off on YouTube and you know I was watching their journey and then they came into obviously the BBC space and you can relate to them. It's all about emceeing and they're trying to make the, the DJs and they're trying to put out like they run a you know a pirate radio station and we've all known someone or someone like that and that's why it's so relatable like. You know those people exist. Um, I just think that there's a great opportunity. I'm just thinking then your to your question around, you know, um, to the point of this podcast. Why do you do what you do in terms of like, why do you pursue this uh, goal around uh, making comedy sketches, making people laugh, uh, pursuing this journey? What motivates you? This is what asks all guests. That's a deep question. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> really it really is, and. Uh, you know, there's so many different um, just things about me that have naturally brought me to this point. It's like <clears throat> it's like asking someone why they why do they breathe? It's got to that point with me with like what I do now, because it just feels like the most natural thing for me to do. So it's like, for example, when you have musicians or uh, you have uh, the most like intelligent like imams that can memorize things like that and quote things like that and it's just you have to really own uh what you're about and always uh give yourself enough time within your life to explore different things to really find what is your calling and i tried so many different things bro like like i said um i, I studied uh, electronic engineering uh I, then i did a grad scheme i was working in the automotive industry um then i was working in lean manufacturing uh then i was working in marketing and then like growing up like i, I was pursuing the sciences so originally i was going to go into the medical sector um then i was like also just uh, trying to uh, uh like <laughs> basically just buy and sell stuff at one point just being like okay how can i make quick money uh, i've tried i've done trading um like i've just tried loads of stuff and it's just what i enjoy the most um but also when i bring in all the things that matter to me for example being a muslim you know uh, making people laugh is a, a huge sunnah to even smile at people uh, and you know at the end of the day like you, uh, if you're a muslim the ultimate goal is the afterlife so uh, I, I pray that whatever uh, bad deeds or bad habits i have like i'm always trying to cancel them out with whatever good work i can do through what i do and there's been so many things where um like i never expected those kind of fruits from this type of labor for example some of the charity projects that i've been able to do um with restless beings who uh the, the company that you got your t-shirt from the kihobo t-shirt um they uh, donate their so, some of their proceeds uh to uh, the, that organization i've like been able to make water wells with them muslim charity i was able to build a boat school for a community that live on water um like cataract camps i've made i've been able to make four alhamdulillah with human appeal um and just like amazing opportunities man so i'm like that's uh, naturally what my path is and sometimes i do feel like you know um 
although we've been given free will, like so much of our destiny is written and it's almost like, you know, when you're watching a movie and you're just sat in your seat and you're along for the ride, you're along for the journey, like so many things within our life are like that. And I feel uh, like from my name, genuinely meaning to laugh, like hashu, uh, hasho, like in shuddha means to laugh, uh, to being where I am today, it's almost just like, I don't know, man, it's just how it is. Yeah, I, I think there's so much um, stuff you can dissect there. Um, got me lost in thought now. <laughs> um, I think I'm think your most that. interesting subject. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yeah. I just, I just thought, like, yeah, I was trying to relate to, like, I see what you mean, especially with the name. Um, like, do you think then our names that are given by obviously our parents, we then somehow live the live uh, live the lives according to our names there must be something connected 100 percent. like what does jalel mean it means i'm um, to my to my to my to, to what i know it's like um wise um bro. <laughs> do you know what i'm saying bro that's the <laughs> that could be mad, someone bro. could someone could phone up and say yeah yeah it doesn't mean that it means this bro uh but yeah that's what well, that's... it's true bro you like uh, uh like i know you're not the type of person to, to uh, like uh what's the uh there's a saying with a trumpet what's the what's the saying trumpeting <laughs> but <laughs> i don't know how to say it in english bro yeah, yeah you're not the type to like toot your own horn you can't that. sing your own trumpet that's the one is it like that. that's yeah. the one bro this is why you are so wise dr jalel man yeah. but bro <laughs> literally like you've got five degrees and your name <laughs> means wise come on man there's a link there do you know what i'm saying so yeah, man, I feel like um, it's, it's you have to like, even though you're a baby, like you're born as a baby, you're born as a Muslim, you're born as a Bengali, you're born as a British Bengali, whatever you're born as, like you have to still discover everything for yourself. Like even though you're a born Muslim, it doesn't mean that you know Islam from day one. Like you have to learn it, bro. So it's like it's the same with ourselves as human beings. Like you have to learn about yourself, bro, because there's certain things that i've learned about myself like oh i feel like this about this and actually i always feel like that about that and some people probably won't agree with that but it's how i feel do you know what i'm saying and you have to like really you can't just be one of these wishy-washy people i see loads of wishy-washy people these days that are just like oh uh, like so flaky like they don't have opinions like in like that they want to stick by they just want to uh, keep everyone uh, in some fairy land and happy and all of this stuff and it's like no man like we're a beautiful society because of our individuality and because of like uh, us being different but holding similarities and we can all learn off each other if everyone just tries to like um, brush past everything then no one's gonna we're not gonna progress like as mentally do you know what I'm saying and even so like things will get brushed under the carpet and mental health will suffer as a result yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you're right about the psychological functioning. Like, if we don't reach our potential, if we don't think openly, then our brain can, you know, destruct, if you like, not construct. Um, so on that question, then, I suppose it's, you know, we talked about the good side and, you know, there's lots of, like, um, you know, aspirational, exciting, you know, energy around. But I want to talk about the dark energy as well. Like, you know, but there isn't, there seems to be, some sort of resistance when other people are progressing. We seem to like, you know, want to stop them in their tracks or try, you know, um, demotivate them or uh, put them down or just like act as a barrier. I don't know if you've ever come across that in Bengali. It's like there seems to be this thing. There's a group of people who are aspirational and driven and, you know, ambitious uh, and adventurous, I should say, more than ambitious. But there's another group of people who don't do that, they do the opposite. Have you come across that? Oh yeah, hundred percent, bro. I've uh, come across it uh, in a uh, personal, direct one-to-one -one encounter with me trying to pursue certain things, like um, just jealousy, hate, like uh, from like your own community, and uh, it's really sad to see. Uh, and I, I like, I've I've really tried to think about like what kind of triggers this or where it comes from. But what are your thoughts on, like, um, have you experienced it yourself? Because I definitely have with, in the, uh, even when, not even my, uh, like, what I do, but 
seeing like Bengali businesses being successful and stuff like that. Like I've seen it a lot. Yeah, it's, it's it seems to be a big, big issue in terms of like, I mean, I think it's different when you're younger because you don't know much. So you just do what everyone else is doing. You know, you just join in the banter, join in the farm. But as you start to grow and start to venture, you realise you're just trying to make a life for yourself. Other people are trying to do it. You don't know what people are going through. And maybe because of the mental health conditions of my family, um, kind of like made me, over time, made me aware, like, you, you know, be careful of, you know, how you put others down. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a journey. But some people seem to be still um, doing it, even at an adult age. When I'm talking, I think it's not, I'm not saying it's um, unforgivable, but it's more forgivable when you're younger because mm. you're still learning about the world. But as you get into your, you know, later on as an adult, I think it's weird <coughs> and it's a bit self-destructive when people do that. I'm like, you should focus on your own life. If you're focusing 100%. on other people, then how, how, you know, what is your, you know, what is your purpose? What is your direction? You're, you're cheating yourself. 100%. Just by looking the other way. <laughs> 100% bro and uh, I've experienced it like with I experienced it to this day uh, when I do certain posts uh, you know um, it was how, it was crazy how'd you, how'd you deal with it um, personally I feel like you once you become familiar to something uh, mm -hmm. and you know like it isn't affecting your immediate environment uh, for example, like it hasn't affected my family's opinions of me or like people that care about me or just in general like people um that are like good and are genuinely about progressing like for example we didn't uh know each other but you and I, I liked your vibe you liked my vibe and as brothers we connected so it's like you know I feel like people that are genuinely about progressing and working hard and they have common goals like that uh, knowing that it hasn't blocked doors for me and it hasn't like changed my family's opinion um all these things that genuinely matter to me that's what firstly was like okay i can look at these hateful comments or i can deal with that person because i know exactly what their intention is with like not wanting my best interests at heart or they're not really someone that's rooting for me i'd rather know that than like not know that because at the end of the day now i know to keep that person at an arm's length uh, because my mom always says uh, this right like your time is a is a blessing from allah you can either spend it worshiping him you can either spend it on the people around you uh, that you care about or you can spend it on yourself and if you aren't spending it on those three then you need a damn good reason of why you're spending it on something else so i'm like when i look at these things i'm like okay the only way i will approach these hateful comments or situations is for the progress for, to progress my own self to increase my understanding of how I'm perceived online and to see whether there is any critical information within here that I can use to my advantage uh, to be better uh, and if there isn't then I wish them well and I, I and I'll just let them be because who knows what that person is going through um so yeah man I think like over time I've just learned to read things uh and trying to take any kind of uh criticism uh, uh with a pinch of salt and like take it on board if it is genuine criticism and then just try and grow from it really yeah it's um it's having a lot of compassion isn't it for the other person and it's a mindset i believe from yourself that is able to do that you know like having boundaries um, to look after yourself and being understanding of the other person, what they might be potentially going through. Um, I suppose it's, it's, it's a, is it a skill, do you think? Like at first it's quite a nasty shock and then after you get used to it. Just for listeners out there, if they're thinking about pursuing their goals and they're worried about other people's judgment uh, and look at what you've done, um, you're putting content out um, kind of like in such in very transparent ways and you know there's no holds barred for you and you're just showing how it is um yeah. do you th what, what do you think of that i think it's uh, an awareness to be honest mm. an awareness that we all have perspective uh and you know um someone else's perspective doesn't necessarily mean it's the truth and also you can always use your perspective uh to like 
make it into something that's going to benefit you so even today for example right like uh I, my uh wife uh, basically tweeted saying uh she ate hutki at 7 a.m right <laughs> <laughs> so this is a true story by the oh, way <laughs> and I, bro i'm on I, i'll see you shaking your head i'm the same bro i was like why is she eating hutki why is she doing that yeah uh in and the then, morning in the morning i know when you're asleep <laughs> I know. And then I'm I'm getting ready to go uh work here yeah? and she's just there eating hutki. And uh, she basically tweeted it. I retweeted it with my own like kind of 7 a.m. my wife's eating hutki. And then uh because she runs the a meme page with me, she uh took a screenshot of it, posted it on the meme page. Hater commented. I can't remember. The, I actually can't remember the comment because it was like once I read it, my I was just pure hate, right? It no genuine criticism that I can take out of it. So even now I can't say word for word what it was because that's how my brain processes it. But my comment back to it uh, was I tagged my wife and I was like, "Oh, look, it's our first hater because it was our first hater because we haven't actually uh posted something together that has gotten hate comments yet." uh because it was uh, we posted a few things around the wedding and it was all love and this is the first time we actually got a, a hate comment so i was like oh like is a hate or you know so <laughs> like i always try to even if there is a hate comment to put a positive spin on it so that at least when they read it as well they'll be like ah oh, man damn it man he made me smile do you know what i'm saying cuz that's my aim like they might be going through some mad scenario no if well first of all you know um i agree with you on hood kid i mean that's uh, <laughs> that's a very uh 7:00 <laughs> in the morning i mean normally if my mom is cooking that when i'm living at home i almost like what is that what are you doing at this time open the door at least i mean like come on i know i you know, know man. but I... the second the second thing is like yeah it's uh, I, I know you said like so your brain kind of like um, has a a safe way of coping with that sort of level of you know content or that reply isn't it because it can be quite psychologically damaging not maybe not people like ourselves who can put boundaries but other people who you know who are reluctant because they're going to get hate but um, it's kind of like practicing or reframing it if you like that's what you've done isn't it reframing it yeah 100% like for example um so, so there's other influencers in the industry uh like for example female ones that I'm friends with that are influencers and I know it takes a really big toll on them you know because just from the way they talk about it when they've mentioned it to me I'm like yeah like they they find it so difficult to deal with and you know I think sometimes like emotion is like a natural uh like reaction from us as as people but like my my thing is like I always try to reflect even if it's for a second before i react because i think that moment of reflection whether it's even the like i've had the maddest family arguments like i live in a bengali household bro of course there's been arguments in my house <laughs> yeah, yeah. like i've had the, i've seen the most maddest situations in front of my eyes and i like I literally i need that few those few moments where everything needs to go slow motion and i need to reflect before i react because if you react instantly you might end up doing something really really upsetting so um it's definitely important but i think one really interesting point and it's a bit difficult to follow but this is how i've kind of dissected it in my brain about why a lot of bengalis within our community hate on other bengalis is because it can be a form of self sabotage so because they know we are bengali they are bengali they are own they almost identify with that person so say for example you sometimes see people in the restaurant industry hating on other people in the restaurant industry they identify with that restaurant and they're like oh i could have done that but that person done that do you know what i'm saying or there might be people like that watch me and they're like oh i could i could do what he's doing but it, because they haven't been able to or for whatever reason everyone's got different lives they might feel the that like they want to inflict self harm like that they like on someone of their own in a sense i don't know if i've explained it very no well. i think it's fascinating <laughs> no, that's that's fascinating i think um you're right um there is a sort of like able to relate it through identity and say 
it's that sort of, you know, what we call armchair fans, isn't it? People who speak to sit as spectators um, and comment on the game and say, I could I could have played that pass and you could have done it better. So I know it's like what they call footballification, um, that we do that with Bengalis and I could do it better. Is it, is it the whole self the self-harm thing? So do you think like these people might have like certain things in their life, low self-esteem perhaps, that's the reason why they're doing it. It's like, why do you spend your time and energy criticizing? You know, why why would you do that? Is it because you feel really low or something? Because they say that we are mirrors of each other and we have what we call mirror neurons, the way we interact with um, other human beings. So we tend to react uh, in a way that's similar to, to what you're saying around, I can identify because this person has been gullied, therefore I have the privilege to, you know, um, criticise or to attack. I think, honestly, the motives can be different person to person. It could be like they've... Uh, uh, like uh, for example like some of the female influencers like the trolls they've had have been like people very close to them and yeah. they've like told me this and I'm like whoa that's crazy like that per- and they're just making fake accounts to comment um or it might be someone that's just like yeah um feeling like they identify with that content creator uh as, like and they see a part of themselves in them and because they're not happy with themselves or they're in a place right now where they wish they weren't and you know they have like hate or a bit of a dark place brewing within themselves they inflict that onto an online content creator who or whoever really like you see the stuff with the royal family like it could be anyone they inflict that onto them because that's their outlet or and they direct it to the people that they connect and identify with so it's like you wouldn't see someone that's in a really dark, hateful place that never watches football go onto mm-hmm. a footballer's account and comment a hate comment. They would most likely uh, do it to someone that they're uh, following or they're just really obsessed and interested with. So, um, yeah, man, it's, uh, I think, different motives. But you have to, um, uh, to give out love, you have to have a place of love. To give out hate, you have to be in a place of hate. That's what I think. I, I agree. I think there's a lot of projection going on. I think it's um, quite, um, you know, discouraging to 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 sort of like to other people might to hear that. Like it's what people do. That it's actually close people around uh, the individual creating fake accounts. That's some very very dark. Um, yeah, takes a lot of energy, and it can, and, you know, I'm sure it must consume them all the time to produce hate like that. It requires a lot of effort. Yeah, like I don't know if you saw the. Um... Uh, Harry and Meghan uh, documentary on Netflix yet but like even yeah. her like um, <laughs> I'm just, uh, <laughs> I think it was like her mm. her stepmom or something she was like creating like so many fake accounts and then those fake accounts were responsible for like 70% of the tweets that gave hate towards uh, Harry and Meghan so it's crazy sometimes it's the people that are closest to you uh, but subhanAllah like it's it's it's, it's Sometimes I, I, it's mad because even when I did, when I started, I remember like I would send on WhatsApp like my videos to like loads of people that were uh, close to me. And then some some of them would be like, oh, like, you know, um, why are you doing this? Like trying to discourage me and all this kind of stuff. And it wouldn't always be like the direct hate. It would sometimes be like the sneaky, like sidestep in trying to discourage you kind of hate. And it's like, well, you're, you're trying to achieve the same thing as the hateful comment really but it's all about awareness bro because at the end of the day like um i don't know if you saw the pursuit of happiness but there's this one thing will smith says and it's an absolute amazing line he goes uh, don't ever tell anyone don't ever let no one tell you that you can't do something if you want something then you go uh, get it like uh, because at the end of the day if you're the one that's prepared to overcome those challenges and those hurdles and you're the one that's ready to put in the effort who is anyone to say no besides Allah like it's down to him like his hukum whether you achieve that goal or not if it's good for you then alhamdulillah if the door opens alhamdulillah if it closes still alhamdulillah because he maybe he's got something better planned for you but you gotta try and and no one should stop you trying 
Well, that, that's the, the uh, that's the way I see it. Absolutely, you you know you want it's like um, life is a series series of experiments. You won't learn from each experiment if you don't if you don't try the experiment. You have to experiment to find the results. And if it doesn't work, that's cool. You have to drop your ego to think that yeah maybe I got it wrong here. Let me try a different way or be open to sort of changing and stuff like that. So it's not as if you're like completely you think you're you know you're right. You know, we are open to new experience. That's why we try different things, right? That's why you've done different roles and you've learned so much, I assume, from all those roles that you did with this engineering, with this social sciences, marketing. It's it's basically still it's still you and the at the core at the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah, and it's like all of it overlaps in so many different ways as well. Like I never thought I would use my engineering degree in ways to like make sure my editing processes as lean and efficient as possible and like thinking of ways like oh I can create a little uh script to just quickly like do this automatic like why am I doing this tedious task over and over again it's literally the same thing so it's like stuff like that it's it's crazy man so um it's really interesting you just have to make sure that you're always learning something that you're interested in I think because as long as it's that you'll never feel like it's wasted time and that you you can always just like benefit from the experience of completing a task like i I don't know how how, um to explain it but genuinely setting yourself a deadline and being like i'm gonna do this by this time like that discipline is so valuable like in itself even if it's like watching a youtube course and being like i'm gonna watch this youtube course this week and learn this skill I'm going to learn how to make a carpenter's table, bro. That looks like a Nintendo SNES controller. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, like, but still, like, it's so useful. So, yeah, discipline is a huge part of it as well. What would you say then are visionaries, like the ones who thought about Bangladesh being independent and we having our own sort of language and recognised and our, you know, um, sovereign being, if you like, um, what would they make of what you're doing now um, in terms of like, here's a, here's a Bengali who's living in Britain, making um, comedy about uh, um, about us so we can educate ourselves about our mannerisms, our etiquette and the way we see the world. What do you think those visionaries would say if they were alive today? That would be crazy, man. <laughs> like to think of like, oh, bro, like the legend, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, like seeing one of my videos, bro, that's just throwing me off like completely. But it is actually, I would love to meet Sheikh Hasina one day. Like, even though I have like done some like subtle comedy around her, like on my channel and stuff. But, um, you know, I feel like uh, w- the most fundamental part of Bangladesh's existence is like the hunger to be independent and the fact that it is all about like having a nation that stands for its language that stands for its roots and its culture and all that kind of stuff and i I feel like um because we were trying to be overthrown from having that in essence like us as british bangladeshis every generation we are almost fighting like a mini liberation war to keep our culture alive within this country so like if i if they were to see it i don't know if they would have this perspective and they would just be like this boy is very disrespectful (laughs) you know what i'm saying but if they were if they asked me about it i would say listen like i'm doing my own mini war here to try and keep my culture alive in the uk because well, my dad decided to come here, so, like, yeah, man, uh, that's how I would kind of um, approach them, but uh, hopefully they would uh, see that it's all with good intentions, and laughter can break down a lot of difficult conversations and barriers, so, with that intent. Do you think, then, our we have our own identity, then? Like, sometimes, um, the reason why I say that is sometimes the British people might not seem that you're British, and the Bengalis might not think you're Bengali, so what happens to this British Bengali? Do they have their own identity? Because sometimes you have both sides telling you that you're not from them. Or, or, uh, in saying that, you have people within them telling you you're part of them. And sometimes you can get a bit lost, isn't it? Like mm-hmm. you have some Bengalis say, you're a Bengali and this, that. And then you have some British who say, no, you're British, mate, kind of thing. And you're like, you know, where do I sit? So do you think we have our own identity, do you think? A hundred percent. I feel like British Bangladeshis as a whole is the birth of like a whole new form of culture like you can't even say like british culture or bengali culture it is a new form of culture because 
I, uh, even if you see like the communities on like not just my meme page like there's so many good like uh british bangladeshi meme pages out there even on tiktok and stuff and you can see the communities the comments and the di the differences of opinions and i find it fascinating like i'll sometimes post a, a meme and I'll expect it to not get the slightest bit of backlash and it'll get the maddest backlash. And then I'll post one that I expect it, oh, this one's going to definitely rile people up and everyone's laughing. And I'm like, wow, like it's so mad to see like how even in this day and age, like we are forever like evolving as a as a new form of culture. And uh, I think that's what it is, you know, like uh, over time we will always have like new values of what is right what is wrong what do we this is something that's good from british culture oh yeah let's take that or oh, this is something nice with bengali culture let's bring that like the maskata ceremony like that's become a whole thing for weddings now and um i think it's almost like you know when you go uh shopping like in a supermarket and you go past all the all the shelves but you only like stop at a few and take what you need it's like that with culture, British Bangladeshi culture, um, and that's kind of how I kind of see it in a metaphorical sense. That's such a powerful line, and you know, would you say that's a lot to do with the overall concept around liberation? Because that's what we were, we were liberated, and, and, and you're saying that, hey, you are free, and you can choose who you want to be, but you belong to our nation in that sense, about liberation. So that's a very good way of putting it. What do you think about liberation and that concept around what you just said about picking uh, what's relatable to you, basically, when you're shopping to uh, the supermarket? Yeah, 100 percent. It's like um, the most liberating thing is to be able to say to yourself, like, uh, even though I'm Muslim, even though I'm British, even though I'm Bengali, like, I don't uh, like uh, have to... Uh, what I don't have to try and worry like 24 7 about um like how do I show that I'm the most Bengali how do I show I'm the most British in this uh, particular environment or how do I show like uh, how do I make sure I'm upholding all my uh, principles as a Muslim like you know sometimes you gotta be like you know to be the best that you can be you just gotta be the best that you can be like as a person and then because you are British because you are Bengali because you are Muslim like all those things will naturally come by you just being you because they're already a part of you um so that's one thing that i always try and keep in mind that you know um always just bring it back down to you being yourself as an individual uh because that's what makes us beautiful being individuals if people wanted to get in contact with you how would they best get in contact with you? just follow your pages if you want to share any details please do so at this in the next uh, few seconds yeah so uh if you ever want to reach out to me uh like if you have anything that you feel like this is something that I want to reach a lot of British Bangladeshis, uh, but it's maybe something that I don't want to get uh, me involved with, but you want like the outreach that I have like to be involved with it, then send it as a DM to uh, the Gushti page, which is at the Gushti on Instagram. If you want to reach me directly, uh, then email me at info at smashbengali.com. And if you ever want to just like work with me on that, just email my manager, he's a beautiful guy, nice smiley guy his name's benji at connectmanagement.com brilliant and before we go basically uh thank you so much for being on this podcast um thanks for your time i want to hand over the microphone over to you just saying a few aspirational inspirational words uh, for our audience who might be listening um, but thank you again once again smash bengali hashu i'm sure we will join you next time but over the microphone over to you Bro, honestly, it has been such a pleasure to have uh, this conversation with you. I feel like I could honestly talk to you all day. Um, thank you for creating this platform and putting effort into trying to create a space like this, because a lot of the time I'm, you know, uh, presenting music or I'm like creating comedy sketch scenarios and I don't ha get to have an open dialogue like this often so it really means a lot uh, to everyone watching please support Dr Jalel and all his efforts uh, rem remember 
once upon a time i was just like a normal content creator with less than a hundred like i started off with zero subscribers like anyone else and we all have to start somewhere and i see amazing things uh for dr jalel inshallah with your support so if you like what he's doing if you enjoyed watching this please do subscribe and share it goes a long way and it will definitely um just put a smile on my face put a smile on his face and you know what? You can smile with us as well. So thank you so much for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next one.